Right, a stats question here from 2015. Question two, we're looking at confidence intervals. So the key thing in these ones, to label all information that they give you. Have your formula book open in the pages, well, it's 35, 36, the pages prior to the Z scores. And it's there's only a few formulas that you need to know. So a survey of 100 shoppers, it's a number of shoppers N, selected from a large sample of a Saturday supermarket shoppers showed that the mean shopping spend was 90.45 and the standard deviation was that. So the mean shopping spend, that's not of the entire population, it's of a sample, it's X cat. So the sample mean and the standard deviation, your wee funny looking boy for that. Then there's two confidence intervals that you need to know. Here it says find the 95% confidence interval for the mean. And when it's for the mean, the formula you need to remember is X cap minus 1.96 standard deviation over root n. So you're going to get an idea on the population mean based on a sample. An idea on the mean of a population based on a sample and we can be 95% confidence the mean lies within the sample at the end. Now just throw in the figures, this bit here, your standard error of the mean, that's in the bottom of one of the pages of the formula book and it says for the mean another confidence interval is for the proportion. Throw in these numbers, 90.45 minus 1.96 standard deviation over root n. And then do the same on the other side, except add it on. And throw all that in your calculator there. Six point three nine a lot, a lot of times in these questions they ask you to interpret the interval ninety four fifty one and that's just what I spat out. We're ninety five percent confidence that the mean and the mean spent will lie within this interval. Now the next one. This is your null hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis hypothesis testing. So a supermarket has claimed that the mean amount spent by shoppers is 94. So that's their claim, that's their population mean, that's their statement of no change. Based on the survey test, so your hypothesis test, you should a 5% level of significance clearly state your null and your alternative and your conclusion. Now there's two different ways you can do this, but to state your null hypothesis statement of no change, HO, the mean amount is 94 euro. Statement of no change, whatever they state. If you like, you can put that in English. The mean is 94 euro, the mean amount spent. You know, so whatever the U U equals. Your alternative to that, H1, U is not equal to 94 euro. Now you can just see from this here, you can use your answer from the first bit. As the 94 euro, so this is method one, I'll show you both ways. So I would do it generally a different way. As the 94 euro lies within the confidence interval, as we can see in part one, as it lies within that interval, we fail to reject null hypothesis, i.e., mean amount spent is 94 euro. The other way that I would do that, generally, if they didn't give you the first part, is use your z-scores method two. You only have to do one of these. So, or do your wee z-scores. Now it's based on a sample, so standard deviation over root n. You can see that formula in the top right hand side. You've got three formulas. This one, the standardizing formula. This one, and then the one for your mean and one for your proportion. Now, throw in your figures here. X cap up the top we said it's 90.45 minus the population mean 94 standard deviation is 20.73 over root 100 then you throw that in your calculator and you get minus 
seven one. So there's two critical regions here. 1.96, think you're 95%, and minus 1.96. If we lie in those critical regions, we reject the null hypotheses. Does minus 1.71 lie within that? No. So we fail to reject. It's backed up there. You know, so a Z does not lie in critical region. We fail to reject H. We fail to reject that null hypothesis. And then the last bit, find the p value. So by doing the z score here, the p value is going to be found anyway. So it just backs up um, what, what you do in your hypothesis testing. So what you do is you use your z score. Minus 1.71. So you find the area of that small region. It's going to be less than a half. So whatever value you get for 1.71, take it away from 1. And you find the area over here as well. So you double it. It's completely symmetrical. So look up 1.71 in your Z scores. Do that now. And you see you get a value of 0 0.9564. There's no way that's covering 95.64%. So you take it away from one, you get your answer 0 0.0436 uh, for each of those regions. And then you find the area of both of them. So you times it by two, only it's 0 0.0872 or 8.72%. Now what you've got to remember is if this is greater than 5%, we fail to reject. Or the way I remember it, if P is low, the hole must go. So you definitely remember that. P is low, the hole must go. The hole mean the null hypothesis. Now what they mean by low is less than 5%. Is that less than 5%? No. So if P is low, the hole must go. So as P is big, greater than 5% or 0 0.05, we fail to reject that hole. Fail to reject null hypotheses. And what this value means, i.e. mean amount, is 94 euro. Yeah. Uh, let me do that first first one as well sure rattle through it when we're at it um so question one here so an experiment consists of throwing two fair standard six-sided dice noted the sum of the two numbers if the sum is nine or less it's regarded as a one nine or less if the sum is eight or less it's regarded or nine or greater it's regarded as a one so nine or greater that's why they got a a 1 at 6, 5, we should get 11. So 6, 3 is a 1. 5, 4 is a 1. 4, 5, 6, 3. All these other ones are going to be 1s then, you know. And that means that these other books are going to be losses. 1, 1, 6, 1. Handy marks there. Just always have a wee look close to the ones at W. 4, 4, yeah, that's 8. 3, 5, that's 8, 6, 2, that's 8, we're good. So find the probability of 1, 1. Now your fundamental principle of counting, if you like, or you can count up all the squares. 6 by 6 is 36 outcomes. 6 and dice 1, 6 and dice 2. We're counting them up. Probability of 1 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 out of 36. You can simplify that, think of 5 over 18. So you've got 5 out of 18 chance of winning, so the probability of loss, 13 out of 18, just to have it. Find the probability that each of the three successive throws of the two dice results in a loss. So find the probability of losing, losing, losing. So as you said, the other probability of loss, 13 out of 18, and losing, multiply, 13 out of 18, and losing, 13 out of 18, or 13 over 18 to the power of 3.
2197. Oh, oh, 5832. And it does say the four decimal places, so SD button 0 0.3767. So that's the answer they want you to use. And then the last bit there, the experiment is repeated until a total of three ones occurs. Find the probability a third one occurs in the tenth row. So not just three ones in ten, third one in the tenth row. So what has happened is you've got two ones in nine, first nine throws, and then one on the tenth. So that's your Bernoulli or your binomial, whatever you like. There's a formula, and then MPR again in your formula book. So two ones in nine, nine choose two. The probability of winning is five over 18 to the power of two, probability of losing, 13 over 18 to the power of nine minus two is seven. By that one in the 10th, same as the one in all the others, five over 18. So they're lovely questions. Throw that in then. Nine, not a fraction. Nine, choose two. Five over 18 squared. And 13 over 18. So five over seven. Five, five over 18. 0 0.079. Four decimal places, three, 0 0.0791. Right, keep practicing those.